So hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we are here with two amazing people who have written uh, a really incredible book uh, called Making the Cut at Pixar. So I've got both Bill and Bobby here and I'll let you guys introduce yourselves or each other or whoever you want to do this. My name is Bobby Osteen and I'm a film historian and I specialize in writing and teaching and moderating events about film editing. But up until now, it's been about live action. And then I uh, stumbled into this world of animation and it blew my mind. What animation editors do is I'm in awe of them. And uh, Bill and I ended up both having the same dream, actually, parallel dreams to write a book about animation editors. Lee Unkrich ended up putting us together. And um, I think we both felt we were very yin yang in this process because I bring my live action experience and also a very, it's very important. I always think editors are underappreciated and misunderstood in general and multiply it times 10 and you have the animation editor. And it's very important for me to, to, for people to understand them, but also figure out a way to communicate concepts that anyone can understand. And Bill has an inside baseball background from working at Pixar and he's more of a techie. And we, you know, he was w wonderful in translating concepts and we challenged each other, um, bringing kind of our two different disciplines and natures and backgrounds together. That's Yin and here's Yang, uh, I'm Bill <laughs> Kinder. Uh, I was at Pixar for 18 years during, during a lovely part of that company's uh, successful ride, starting with A Bug's Life, uh, when the editorial department was, I think, four or five people. Uh, and, uh, by the end of my time there around Coco, uh, we were 65 strong working on multiple productions. So it was a wonderful ride, uh, learned so much from the editors there really about, uh, editing, about animation, uh, and you know, how those two go together. I think as, as Bobby said, you know, I, I brought some of what we did at Pixar uh from all those years of experience to to the process of writing the book and bobby really helped me uh explain clearly what what i uh thought i knew you know for me you know if you kind of go go back to kind of the, the parallel action bobby's working on telling the story of live action editors um and probably around the same time ed catmull asked me to give some talks to film students about editing animation. And I thought, why are we, why would we do that? We're busy, we're making movies. I, I'm not sure I have time to stop down and give a talk, but okay, okay, boss. And uh, really that was the seed of so many of these ideas when I realized that this kind of rising generation of filmmakers was so interested in uh, the art of, animation, the role of the editor in making these stories and, and telling these stories. Um, I thought, okay, there is something here. Uh, there's a hunger for it. And I want to, I want to tell this story. And then as Bobby said, we, we came together thanks to the great Leon Critch. And what was interesting was I had done two events with, um, Pixar editors. One was Ken Schretzman who had just done Toy Story 3 and Nick Smith, who had actually been a live action editor for 30 years. And um, they both explained what they did in these events and showed footage and everything. And then with the, when Nick did his event, Carol, the great Carol Littleton, who edited such films as E.T. and Body Heat, actually like lunged at him in the lobby afterwards. And she said, oh my God, I, I had no idea what you did. I'm in awe of you. I, I couldn't do this. And you know, he was, of course, thrilled, but it just shows that even live action editors didn't know because there, Nick said when he came to work at Pixar, he said, oh, this is going to be a piece of cake. You just cut the heads and tails off the slates and, you know, just going to cruise through this job. And then he, he later said, 
the good news is you can do anything. And the bad news is you can do anything <laughs> <laughs> because it's the combination of the digital, digital editing and the microscopic sort of overwhelming nature of animation editing and being involved from the very beginning um, at the at the storyboard stage or even story pitch stage. So, so his perspective was really interesting too, but it, it also, that was my ride, you know. Um, it's sort of like editors have superpowers in my mind and they, they really have to use it, use it, use all those powers to the nth degree when they're editing animation because they're starting with a blank slate, basically. You know, the storyboards are, there's no, there's no interaction between actors. They have to create the interaction. There's not even room tone. So, um, and sound is not tied to picture. So they have to create the rhythm of interaction, but they can also manipulate it in the most microscopic way. So the dialogue editing was the first thing that really blew my mind, but they're also just cartoon boards. You know, there's no depth. They have to figure simple things out as how many steps to walk across a room, you know, and how do you figure that out? You know, things like that. So um, yeah, that, that, that was the first thing that was really, I think blew everybody's mind when I did those events was the storyboard process and how, how long it takes, but also how, how much you can do there as an editor. If only live action editors could sit in on story meetings, it would be invaluable. I mean, they should, but they don't, you know, and to be involved, to have an editor's, you know, editors are, have so many um, talents in terms of pre-visualization and empathy and finding dramatic beats and story arcs and um, character arcs and there, there's just they're they're fully used in in the animation world and that's very exciting a bit about the process then because maybe some i'm sure most people who uh, are watching this probably work in animation in some capacity but the, even they may not know the actual role of the editor when it comes to animation. So it'd be interesting to kind of step through it briefly, if you can. I know you've written a whole book about, but, you know, to kind of say, look, from start to finish, what does the editor do? And and like, how did that come about as, as part of their role? My, my quick thumbnail would be, you know, it is from start to finish. The editor, we used to say, is like the Marines. They're first on, last off. They They start the battle and finish it. They don't wrap until the show is over and they're there from the inception they they have to understand the initial spirit of the story and then protect that and carry it forward often for years as everybody knows these animated films take many years and uh to kind of maintain that creative um spine to stand up to the various winds of change and doubt that come along on these massive projects um, really requires some fortitude. You know, the animation department would say, ah, you know, that was, that was a great show. Uh, I, I went to vacation in Bali. Where have you been? It's like, well, we're still, we're in post-production. We're still in it, you know? So that's kind of the mindset. You know, there's a chapter in the book about the, the warrior mentality and the kind of endurance and marathon spirit that is demanded of editors in animation, I would say, feature animation in this case, for sure, but also television animation. You know, that's the part that I would touch on, but there are a few dimensions to that to that uh, answer, Bobby. I bet you've got one too. Well, I mean, one of the things Bill and I always talk about is that they're the guardians of the story. So what's sort of sad in a way is this beautiful work they do at the storyboard stage um, is the bedrock. And, and the, the, the storyboards will be gone forever and the public will never see them. But the editor has to remind, and, and there's a lot of dazzling things that happen after that. There's layout and, you know, it's somewhat robotic characters moving through 3D space. And then you have the animators who are kind of like the actors, they fine tune the performances and the detail and it's, but the editors and sometimes are <laughs> nicknamed the entertainment killers. <laughs> Because they're the they're the kind of conscience of the movie, and they have to even remind the director to keep on track and and 
you know, what, what are we telling and is it working? And, and maybe that character that smells of flower in the middle of a scene is cute, but it ruins the, the momentum of the scene. And, it's, and the editor is the guardian of that. And they always have to keep their eye on that ball. And then um, we were talking um, about cutting jello. <laughs> I, I think um, cutting <laughs> jello, like the, yeah, the yeah, dessert. Yeah. Um, that's the other part of it is that um, the ground is never steady under an editor's feet because they can go back to storyboards when they're already in animation or layout. Everything keeps changing. And the, uh, the cutting room is the hub of all that. They're the center. Everything comes in and out of editorial, everything. So no matter what stage you're at, the editor is oh, it's always being tracked and monitored and watched by the editor. So that's the marathon part of it too, you know, just to not get lost in the microscopic nature of it or just um, how long it takes and is this still funny? Is this still working? And there's a lot of... Um, like the marine thing, I like that too. Yeah, it's it takes a lot of discipline, but it also, they sometimes have to be the bad guys in a way, just to say, let's remember what why we're doing this, you know? From the beginning to the end, you know, Bobby just alluded to this idea of, of a hub, of a wheel. And so often we think of production as a pipeline. We call it a pipeline. They call it, everyone calls the pipeline. And that means you put sing in the pipe at this end and it comes out this end. Um, but it's kind of a broken metaphor in, in animation really. And certainly the way Pixar treated editorial as the hub of the wheel where things are going around and around and around editorial. And if you think of each department as a spoke on that wheel, as opposed to a segment in the pipe, you have a much clearer image, much more accurate image of what the editor is doing in the center of the wheel. You've got story is the first, maybe most important spoke. Uh, then you've got layout, then you've got uh, lighting, then you've got animation, excuse me, animation, lighting, effects, rendering, sound along the way. And it's non-linear. I, I went out of order, but actually it was probably accurate because these things uh, you know, kind of smear together and give you this jello image that, that Bobby referred to. It really makes it hard for the editor to, to be that spine and hold up the, the values of the story that everybody started with. The beauty is that the editor gets input at every stage, which is amazing. Like even in layout, they can ask for different coverage, different angles, different... You know, um, it's as if a live action editor could sit on a set and ask for footage instead of triaging <laughs> what's dumped in their cutting room that they have to make work. Yeah. I mean, the beauty of that as well. And, and they go to animation dailies and talk about hookups of shots and if things aren't working. So they're really, it's a responsibility, but it's also the joy of having being listened to all the time, you know? Here's, here's another way of looking at it too, is that the film at any given time could really only be presented by the editor in its entirety, shot to shot with the latest sound. Um, there are tools of course now for seeing sequences and playing them back, but the latest, most intentional thing is held, protected, guarded <laughs> by the editor. And, you know, we used to create a, a kind of seance feeling, if you will, to those presentations, right? It wasn't, it wasn't tossed off. It wasn't like, oh, let me look at this shot on my laptop or, you know, it was like, come in, have a seat, take a breath. We're gonna turn the lights down. The sound is set to the proper level. Here's what we've done. Here's what we want you to look for. Here's what we need your comments on. Is everybody ready? It wasn't, you know, this flyby thing and we're making cinema, you know? And, and this was something I, I definitely got from Leon Grich, who was a very early adopter of having a projector uh, in the edit suite long before I had ever seen that and really creating an environment where 
we're here to sit and watch this thing in church, like the parishioners after us. I mean, that was his background. You know, he went to USC cinema school and the irony is he was hired because he knew the avid, but, but his knowledge of cinema was invaluable because the, the original brain trust, the original um, creative team at Pixar, they didn't have any cinema background. They certainly didn't have editing background, but you know, this, this new kind of animation, CGI animation was really a, a melding of traditional animation and cinema. So he was, he was invaluable and, and because they were so inclusive, he was in the conversation and was listened to and respected and they were open to what they didn't know. And that started everything, set the pattern for editors. And because Toy Story was the first feature animated film in the, in this new medium, you know, so. Did you know, did you know that when they were planning Toy Story, there was a lot of thought given to not having an editor on the crew. Whoa. Like, why would you need one? <laughs> yeah. People who were there, that was, that was before my time, but um, you know, they came from an animation background. They came from a very technical background. Bobby calls me a techie. I, I, I'm not. Um, no, it just I, seems I that way because I worked at Pixar. But I mean, as a compliment, you have to. I'll take it. I mean, you're the only you're the only one out of all of us here wearing a microphone. You know, so that's I'm glad I, that's true. Busted. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, no, but I, I no, I'm I'm happy to wear it proudly. But I, you know, these people were true computer science brains. I am not. Um, these are PhDs. They would say that more PhDs worked on Toy Story than any film prior. Right. So I'm talking about people with large brains, very technical brains and animation brains saying, I think we can cut a corner on the budget here. Why would we need an editor? And that's a real, that really happened. So, you know, you, you have to have that contrast to understand how kind of radical, how, how huge a sea change it was for someone like Lee to come in and say, you know, hang on guys, we don't need to treat this like you guys think about animated filmmaking. We can be actually making a movie here. Yeah, if you look at the Pixar shorts previous to that, there's very it's very obvious that they didn't have that knowledge. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's very story um, board driven. And, you know, it's something interesting where not to, you know, because obviously story is super important and, and boarding is important. And that's where, you know, you create your animatic. And once you edit it, you really see where the, the failures are. You know, but storyboarders see themselves as editors as well, which is an incredible thing because they're approaching it still with an editorial mindset. That's true. They are. They are. They absolutely are. And that's the that's the kind of point of continuity. We did a lot of research uh, during the pandemic uh, on animation history and, and how did people put together storyboards without an editor? If you look at the, the continuity of that history, it might make sense in 1994 to think maybe we don't need an editor because they, they really were just technicians, pair of hands, kind of gluing together pieces that were conceived by directors and, and storyboard artists. Um, so it's really interesting to see kind of that inflection point to you know, what happened to that continuity. And now you add these digital tools for editing and a cinematic live action brain and this CGI virtual world where you can position a camera with lenses and stage characters just like a movie uh, in live action. And um, those are really kind of the key ingredients to why so much changed all at once, I think, uh, with the first CGI film. Yeah, they were called cutters in the early days. <laughs> they were, there's, there's, their role was yeah. clerical. Yeah, yeah there, there was a building on the Disney lot, the cutting building, you know, it's, it's still there. It's, it's a lovely Art Deco sign and, and a great irony uh, or, or coincidence that Pixar originally was uh, in those days on Cutting Boulevard. So I don't know. What does it mean? <laughs> yeah, what does it mean? Well, I mean, you know, if you think about I don't know. You guys can totally inform me in my terrible guess, right? But I, this is this is something I, I feel a great privilege in talking to both of you that you can correct me on this. But, you know, a lot of 
Disney's development for storytelling came through the boarding process and how they kind of then edited the story. And it was all developed out of that. But it seemed to be like Pixar's early success is definitely because of how they approached editing a story from that point of view. So like, obviously you joined in uh, for A Bug's Life and you were there for quite many, many years, <laughs> many years. Um, but like, how did the editorial team develop then with that kind of in mind? Like, how did it emerge? Did you guys change the process each time? You know, um, we, we definitely took stock. I got there right at the end of Toy Story and, and a lot of things got, uh, you know, sort of post-mortem and what, what just happened. Um, uh, but, but for me, the, the answer to that question uh, is sort of uh, in terms of what changed, what took off, uh, in a lot of ways, has to do with sound. You know, the, the storyboarding stuff that you're talking about visually, um, there's no doubt that the traditions of Disney and what he set up, like, and I mean Walt Disney set up with yes. yeah. uh, story reels and sweat boxes and all these kind of methods for developing a story in, in pencil drawing, um, we're, we're honored, you know, we're studied rigorously by you know, the original founders of, of Pixar. And, and also when, when Lee and some of the early editors got there, try trying to understand that, but the freedom that they had in the mid nineties, all of a sudden that was new, uh, was this thing called the Avid and they mm. could edit sound. Mm -hmm. They could take the voice performance and chop it in a way that really had never been available to people working in the unwieldy mag days where you would take <laughs> the recording done by the actor, transfer it to 35 millimeter, mag stripe film, cut it. Wheel, wheel on your Steinbeck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You really would be, it would be laborious. Um, and, and you would, didn't have the precision. You had quarter frame precision, whereas, um, you know, you can really get down to the phoneme Look that one up. Great word, yeah. You know, the <laughs> micro syllable, um, you know, that Lee did. He really was able to stitch together uh, sentences, performances, phrases, words that were recorded months apart by great actors and build a character, build a performance from these ingredients. And then, of course, everybody knows that the picture comes after that. That is the you know, foundation for uh, the animation, for the performance, for the life, uh, the illusion of life that is going to come after is the voice. And um, I think, I think for me, that's what I would draw people's attention to in terms of like what, what really took off the secondary thing. That's also important is Lee's understanding that, you know, what we, he studied and he talks about this in the book, he studied animated films and animation history. He was a, a scholar of film. He was interested. How do they do this? I haven't done animation before. How are we going to do this? And he realized quickly that this 3D thing, the CGI thing was different from all the 2D stuff that came before. And he could throw that rule book out the window and re help remake um, this style, this approach to filmmaking with these new, new tools, right? Yeah, treat it like a live action movie. I mean, not like a cartoon. And, you know, yeah, the non-destructive nature of digital is, was a huge freedom to, um, to shape performance. Amazing. Particularly when you're creating interaction and there is the challenge of that, you know, it's not natural. People are not in the room together, for example. You know, I really, really love that. And obviously, like we said before, but that's probably why you dedicated so much time in the book about sound you know because it's something that people totally overlook all the time and how important it is like you said bobby like how do you figure out how many steps it takes for someone to cross a room like how do you decide that um and there's like the sound dictates timing but it also dictates atmosphere like there's so much that it creates um and all you have is a frame like i remember as a child a child, sorry, this is gonna make you feel old, Bill. Sorry, um, <laughs> a, a young teenager, let's say, having like I think the very first DVD I ever bought was Monsters Inc. 
And I remember going through the story reels that you would put on those. Um, cool. I, I, love them. I, have, I have some of them here anyways, oh. right behind me, because I hold on to those. It's so important to have that stuff, the special features. And, yes. But going through and just, it's just a, a slideshow if you take out the sound, but when you add the sound in, it like it creates everything, you know, the performance of the actors, the sound, everything like that. So could you talk a bit more about the sound and why you thought it was so important, even though I've just answered it? <laughs> Sorry. No, I mean, uh, we have a quote in the book mm. from Gary Rydstrom, the great uh, sound designer, sound mixer, who did so many of Pixar's films, uh, who talks about sound being the side door to the viewer's mind. You know, it, it, it's a it's a way into the the spectator's worldview that they're not really thinking about because we are so focused visually, um, and really so much get so much texture, um, so much uh, uh, of the of the life of of a character comes from sound. Those are the cues that I think we all instinctively respond to just as humans. And um, so, yeah, a lot of work goes into uh, the sound. And it never uh, changes either. That's what's so interesting. Despite the visuals changing, the sound doesn't. So it better work in the storyboard stage because that's, and, and what's, what's so impressive too is when they're screening story reels um, and storyboards, um, they work if it doesn't sit and then it sings in storyboards how is it going to look when it's finally animated it's going to just up the ante but it really has to play it has to be funny it has to be moving it all that has to work and it never changes so the responsibility the the deepest res most constant responsibility is really sound uh, and the editor had better get it right. And they do, <laughs> but it's, it's such a high priority, you know, it, it's like it, the bedrock concept. <laughs> bedrock concept. And, and, you know, the other way to think about it is it's, it's like music, you know, it's the most comparable, um, medium here, I think for us to try to help people understand it's like music happens in real time. You don't listen to your favorite song at double speed, <laughs> you know, yeah. it works because it's, it's happening, you know, in a certain rhythm cadence. Um, and, and those are the sort of elements that an editor is, is creating out of nothing, right? These, these vocal performances are recorded like in a vacuum, in a sound studio with no other actors around, uh, no props, no, you know, just they're in a vacuum. So, all the editor has is their ears and their memory of what uh, voices mean. <laughs> it's very abstract. And what sounds natural and even, yeah, the, the pacing and the timing and all those things, they have to really be finely tuned to the, uh, the naturalism of it, but also the, the emotional impact of it. And, and what's so also amazing is when you think of these storyboards, that play these rough drawings, these black and white drawings. I mean, a lot of it is that choice too of storyboards, but they're but they the fact that they play so effectively when there's when the visual is so primitive says something about how beautifully rendered those the 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 whole landscape of sound is that the editor has created at the storyboard stage. Let's switch gears a little bit then. Just you guys have written a book. <laughs> you know, it's great to talk about this stuff. But what I love the most about the book is the additional content you provided for people to go through. If you just want to talk about that briefly, or as long as you want. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, stop me. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I'm touched that you held on to your Monsters, Inc. You know, bonus material. That means so much to me, you know. So if you think about Bugs Life was... Uh, this great moment to take a digitally originated film, right? These movies are born digital long before that was a known term and could arrive to your TV set on a digital medium, 
with very little loss, right? Comparatively, we all remember what came before. So um, we were all giant fans at Pixar of the Criterion collection, still, still am personally. Um, and we just aspired to um, giving the behind the scenes look to um, how these films were made that you know had the same level of care that you would get on a Criterion edition, that the, the mastering of the image and the sound would have the same level of care we were fanatical about it. Um, and I can tell you that we often tried to tell the story of editorial, what is an editor doing on these films in the DVDs. Um, and there are those before and after comparisons where you can see you know, the, the story reel compared to the final. Um, Okay, but here's the secret. Those things are always a cheat. They're not really the real deal because you're you're stuck with the final sound of the final movie, which is not at all how it sounded in editorial. Um, and that's because there were scratch voices, there was temp music, there were temporary sound effects. There, everything was in a state of jello. And there's no way to make a perfectly synchronized um, version of that thing with the final thing, nor to be able to hear both things at once, nor to be able to offer the viewer what something sounded like before it had Tom Hanks and Tim Allen, let's say. So um, that was part of the mission of this book is to be able to share what the actual story reels for Monsters, Inc., for example, for Toy Story, for Toy Story 3, for a range of these films, um, what they actually look and sounded like in the editing room, um, which is not something that we ever were able to share on those DVDs for, for all kinds of commercial, technical, and other reasons. Um, and so it's a point of pride for me that now we can offer that in this book. People can see what, what that really looks like, and a lot of it looks rough. You'll you'll be amazed at how crude some of this stuff looks before it gets polished. And that's, I think, an important lesson coming out of, you know, what is the editor doing is taking this raw material that's so, uh, so in such a brutish form, and you know, honoring it and giving it just the best the best uh, approach that can be had in that moment until it keeps building and building on those good ideas. And you, and it's such a frustration because I, I've i interviewed over 70 editors of live action and we've done, done all these events. And I think I, maybe once or twice, we were able to show something, that, or an early version and then how it was transformed in the cutting room. You never get the opportunity, even in live action, to do it. show and tell is so important in a, in a in a medium that's visual and instinctual and you can't really talk you can talk about it but to be able to illustrate concepts was such a luxury in this book it was it was a really driving force for for me and Bill coming from as I said different backgrounds but with that same you know passion to really pull back the curtain and show how how the editor the transformative aspect of being an editor and you know the thing you were saying about the looking at those early storyboards and and that they worked <laughs> you know and that that as i said before no one gets to see this stuff this is all editorial you know and now you have the luxury with the book to be able to actually experience it so it's very rewarding i love the point of like how important it is to display what you're talking about because there's always that one moment that always sticks with me as to like okay just by showing it they've nailed it here and the magic is there it's like when john williams was receiving his afi award and steven spielberg got up and said listen uh here's what we hand to him <laughs> you know? and here's what we get back you know and he shows it without music and then with the music and how much it transforms it so how important it is to offer people this stuff is amazing so thank you guys that's really wonderful totally. 
No, no, that's a great example. <clears throat> Another aspect of, of the video uh, in the book that I, I love is the interview. So we interviewed so many editors. Bobby conducted all the interviews wonderfully, really brought these folks out uh, to talk about their craft. And I think it's so important. You're just sitting there in the cutting room with these men and women who have spent decades doing this work listening to them in their words talk about what are they doing? Let's take a tour of your system. What is in here? Yeah, what? Yeah. You know, what is all this? And and what are you looking at when you look look at this stuff? And and how do you talk about it? And, you know, we interviewed some people uh, and they're all so different. You know, there really isn't a, a, a type of editor. Um, and I just love the richness of you know, perspectives that, that you get from just hearing editors talk about their work to responding to their work. There's one moment where an editor is talking about humor and how, how do you keep the funny? And, you know, we, we had a, a sequence on an iPad and, and we showed it to him before and after. And just watching him watch his own work and then reflect on it and talk about it, to me, is, is priceless. Where have you ever seen that before? Yeah, and they're so appreciative because they nobody ever shines the light on them. They're always the invisible, <laughs> you know. And, In a dark and, room, and, yeah. I mean, even when I do events, they always think they're going to be terrible and they're always amazing, you know, but they always like sort of blink when they go on stage like deer in the headlights, like, wait, I'm, I'm the center of attention now? I get to talk about my work, you know? And their work is, is really important to talk about because it is so elusive in a lot of ways. And the show and tell part about, you know, whenever I did events, even in live action, you want to talk about things that are, I don't want to see some scene that's just fun to watch. I want to see a problem or a challenge and see how they solved it. And, um, you know, they don't get to talk about that. And it's, it, it's endless what you can learn from editors because there, there's so many complicated sort of aspects to how, what goes into making something work, you know, makes it, making something sing. Making something sing, wow, what a great way to put it, yeah. Okay, you've written a book that shines a light on those gremlin editors who are hiding away in their little rooms and <laughs> never get to see the light of day. Um, you, you're written a book about these editors you've provided all this additional material, which is great. So it's not just like a history of the craft or anything like that. It's that, but also practical details and actual real, the, the level of work that you guys have done to bring understanding, you know, which is vital in a book. <laughs> you know, you need to communicate the message is unparalleled. So what do you hope when people read this book, what do they get out of it? I think, I think, as I said, or we both talked about the role of the editor is, is a, they're like superpowers in the in this in this medium. They're able to use all their gifts fully, and there's you know it's it's as I said the ability to pre-visualize the ability to read. They're writers. They're not only the final writers. Live action. They're the final writers. In this case, they're the writers throughout. They're you know um, it's it's. Uh, you know, there's so many things an editor has to have, you know, it's, it's, it's technology is the, the, in a way, the least important thing. It's, 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 they do have to be organized and detail oriented, but, but the empathy and the ability to, to transform an audience and, and involve, keep, you know, get an audience involved in a story and keep them there by the seat of their pants throughout takes a great deal of awareness of, timing and pacing and staging and there's there's just so many so many aspects to editing and editors have historically always been um i'm in the background or or invisible and i uh, i just i think it's it's imp i think it's great to discover as i did i stumbling on this world of computer animation and animation editors and how how amazing they are, but also the dual thing of, of describing the process of animation and celebrating the most un, unsung heroes of cinema. Nice. I like that. I, I, uh, 
Cole, you, you talked about our book, putting a light on editors. I, I would say we put the Klieg light, you know, it's like massive, you know, 10 K HMI blast on the work that editors do. Yeah. Um, I hope that's, that's what I hope we'll get out of it. Um, you know, it's this idea that creating emotionally compelling cinema is not easy. How, how do you do that? How do you do that with pixels? How do you do that with pencils out of nothing? Okay. So understanding this really requires a kind of advanced literacy, I think, you know, a, a real understanding on how to, how to read the work, how to understand what goes into the authorship of this work. And this is just kind of uncharted stuff. People, it's not out there. And that's what I hope uh, people get from the book is an understanding of the, the creative contribution the editor is making to these you know, resoundingly emotional, culturally significant films. Bringing a lot of joy to the world. The editor is right there on the ground. Yeah, totally. I mean, I'm wearing a t-shirt of one of the films, so I guess it's pretty important, <laughs> you know, but that, like, I mean, that's it, isn't it? It's like, how do I make this story resonate? You know, how do I, how do, how do we connect to you? And they have their hand on the pulse of the audience, you know, that they're, they're really the audience, they really feel a responsibility. Mm -hmm. I love that. Listen, thank you so much for your time, guys. I really, really appreciate it. I would encourage everyone to go out and read this book, please, you know, especially anyone for obviously, you know, this is a book for anyone who wants to understand the role of the editor, um, but crucial for anyone editing as well, I would say, in terms of, you know, learning new processes, always learning new tricks. Um, but thank you so much, guys, for your time today, but also the time you've taken to make a book. <laughs> about this stuff thank you thank, thank you Cole. You. Cool. really thank enjoyed you. talking to you <laughs> yeah, yeah we, this was wonderful really appreciate your taking the time really really appreciate it thank you so yeah, much thank, so thank much. you so much have a good day night all right and everything thank too you. listen thank i'll talk to you guys so take care all right appreciate Goodbye. it bye bye, -bye. bye, -bye Cole.